What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. You're listening to episode 257. I am your host, Greg. I'm here tonight with Ryan and Tyler. Happy holidays, guys. We're uh, the day after Christmas. We didn't want to record yesterday. We are recording the day after Christmas because the stuff has happened. There's actually some stuff to talk about uh, while the Red Wings are on holiday break. But how you guys doing? How was your holiday? Doing great. Holiday was good. Not not too crazy. Um, like I feel like a lot of a lot of people this year have had Christmas as being more of a low key thing than than years previous. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just people that I've surrounded myself with. But it seems like it's it was a little more low key than usual. Usually it's a massive big deal and people are traveling everywhere. No one really in my circle was traveling anywhere, and uh, we only hit up two places as opposed to four as we usually do. So. Ah, uh, good though all, overall, and uh, just looking forward to getting back to hockey. And obviously, the World Juniors were pretty great too so far. Yeah, I wish mine was Loki. We uh, we we hosted at Christmas. We were out of town for two Christmases, and then back home for the actual Christmas. So uh, a little bit here, there, and everywhere. I'm still quite tired from it, and also worked today. So thankfully, it's all onboarding and training, so nothing too intense. But uh, it did allow me to have on in the background the World Juniors, so I'll take it. Yeah, uh, my kids have a really awesome talent for getting sick directly before a holiday. So Christmas, the day before Christmas Eve, my daughter got sick, and she's still like she had a fever on the twenty second. Uh, I had it on the twenty third. Had a fever the first half of Christmas Eve, and were able to get it down to like ninety nine point five, and she was good to go. But now she developed the the cough that I've had for like two months that is finally going away. She yeah. now started to get it. So is your whole house decontaminated? Yeah, I got uh, one of my Christmas gifts was an air purifier. So that thing is running on Ooh. full blast in the living room just to try to get rid of everything. Um, but yeah, hectic, hectic holidays, man. Whenever you got kids, holidays are normally hectic because you got to run yep. to five different places and it's insane. But I'm glad everyone non-stop, had a great holiday. Non-stop for ours. And having the, the 11-year-olds, whatever, she can handle it. But the one and three-year-old um, are officially running on fumes. And they look like zombies as of today. So thankfully, they've got a week to recover before having to go back to daycare. Yeah, that's also what happens when half of your meals consist of nothing but sugar for two days. My one-year-old on Saturday was walking around and all of a sudden he just like burped and threw up cookie. And I was just like, I hate everyone right now. That's amazing. I can handle poop. I can't handle puke. That is the one thing that sets me over the edge. And I will also puke trying to clean it up. My wife's the same way. Uh, She also cannot deal with vomit stuff. So that's my job. Um, but we got hockey Gross. stuff to talk about. We'll move away from bodily functions and into hockey. Hey, it kind of describes the Red Wings right now. Yeah, right. Like you want to throw up watching Oof. them. Yeah, look at that transition. Uh, I think we'll start with the World Juniors, though. Uh, Nate Danielson had himself a day. Uh, Nate the Great, he was named uh, was a player of the game for Team Canada today. Yep. That was tweeted out by Scott Wheeler. I think initially tweeted out that Nate Danielson was named player of the game for Canada. But Elite Prospects put out that for game score leaders for day one, uh, Theo Lindstein was the game score leader, ranked number one. Number two was Nate Danielson with a game score of 2.43. And what they say is that a game score is weighted shots, shot assists, entries, exits, breakups, and et cetera to measure five-on-five impact. Uh, He had the second highest impact on the day Nate Danielson did. And he had a goal and an assist for Team Canada. I didn't get to watch the game because I was busy taking down a Christmas tree and cleaning my house and making sure my living room didn't look like a hurricane had gone through. And uh, but I hear the game was good. You guys watched the game. Yeah, I watched a lot of it. Um, Danielson was by far the best player on the ice, I thought. Um, Every time Canada had a, a dangerous opportunity, it seemed like it was Danielson. Um, Poitras as well was pretty good uh, for Team Canada. Um, can, but you, yeah, can you Danielson, say that with a little more a little more Boston accent, Tyler? Patra, I think they say. But uh, but no, Danielson was really good. Um, it, it's almost like you know a lot of people say that that the Wings not have missed like swung and missed on some of these draft picks. I don't think they have. But uh, Danielson looks like he could be one of the best forward prospects for sure. 
and uh, we we weren't sure if that was going to be the case when they drafted him. Like it was like a most cider, but a forward kind of situation where like we're like, oh wait, this guy should have been taken like you know ten spots behind, and now he's taken where he was taken. And and then you know you start watching the video, you start seeing you know what he's capable of, and it's like, oh wow, this guy's actually pretty good. And uh, it turns out that I mean. So far, I know it's only one game, but two points in one game, and he looked really damn good uh, out there for Team Canada. I think that he has a chance to, if Canada's going to do anything in this tournament, it's going to be led by him and Patras, honestly, I think. I think what we had said initially is when he was drafted that we got him and Sandin Palika in the same round, and we said just don't worry about where, what number they were taken, that we got two really good prospects. And now it's looking like, hey, maybe like, he should have been picked there and that sending Pelika probably should have been picked around the same spot because he's looking like a, a top defensive prospect too. Yeah. I'll say one other thing just too quickly, like, you know, Macklin Celebrini is supposed to be the number one overall pick coming up in this year's NHL draft playing at Boston university right now. Um, you know, leading the nation in points, I believe, and, and, you know, kind of ripping it up there. But I'll tell you one thing right now, Danielson looked even better than Celebrini. So does that mean that 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 he's going to go on to have a better career than Celebrini? I don't know, but very early in the tournament, so far so good for Danielson and, and and honestly so good so far so good for a lot of the wings uh picks uh in this world junior so far. Yeah, I, th- I think it was great about uh, Danielson. He did all of that. He had a goal and an assist and also was just kind of here there and everywhere. He's busy on the PK and he did it all in 13 minutes and 23 seconds of ice time. Now, if, correct me if I'm wrong, they've got a bit of a weird setup for this tournament where it's, what, 18 or 20 skaters? 20 forwards, out, yeah. 20, 20, skaters. 20 skaters out there instead of, what, the, the typical 18? So there's a couple extra bodies that they can utilize. But, I mean, for being, I think it was sixth and ice time of, out of all the forwards, you can't be really too upset about that. And names that were ahead of them in, t- in terms of ice time, you got a Matt Savoy, Put, Patros, however you say that. Uh, Connor Geeky. I mean, he's behind some guys, Fraser Minton, that are dudes that are already in the NHL to do what he did out there. And best part was watching the broadcast. They were gushing over him on NHL Network and then TSM broadcast. And you could also say the same for Pelka for how he started the game out, got an assist early on for Sweden, who just completely handled their business. Their power play do not give them penalty or take a penalty against them because they're going to eat you up. But so see what I liked about Danielson in particular is that he was always involved in the play when he was on the ice and his four check is what we saw going back to training camp and the aggressiveness and what he was doing out there. But then the, hot, the smarts came with it. Once he got the puck, there's one play in particular where he got left alone below the faceoff dot in the near boards. The defensemen both kind of just escaped him and he just drove the net. More often than not, you see maybe a guy just straight shoot that, but he the instincts took over, and he he was just always causing havoc in tight on the net, and it was it was good to, good to watch today. Yeah, it was a goal scorer's goal that he scored. It wasn't just like a, you know, anyone could score that kind of goal. It was a, it was a good pass, and then he he was able to bury. You know, that's something that a lot of these wings prospects uh, forwards wise haven't that we've seen so far haven't really been able to bury. You know, and this is this is one thing that if Danielson could be one of those guys. They can not only make some good passes, but can also bury. I mean, that's your second line center of the future, or maybe your first line center of the future. If if, if Dylan Larkin, you know, obviously Larkin's your guy right now, but you know, is Danielson better than him going forward? We don't know. We'll find out. Uh, the one thing that was interesting to see is, is Danielson was on the third line uh, with Owen Beck and Owen Allard. So it'll be interesting to see if the tournament uh, or as the tournament goes on, if if he moves up the lineup there. Yeah, I think he might, but. If he's getting ma- meaningful minutes across the board, whether it's on the power play, I didn't really see power play time, so I can't speak to that just because, like I said, I was watching off to the side. But when I did look up, I saw him on the PK. So if he gets kind of buried and lost on power play time, that'll be kind of disappointing because I feel like the playmaking could really stand out. But if he shift moves up on uh, on first or second, that'd be fantastic. But I'm not going to get too up in arms if he's not. Yeah, I think if we go to the next player who's kind of seems like they've solidified themselves as a solid prospect is Trey Augustine. Uh, Trey Augustine's Ooh. Team USA played against Norway. They won four to one. 
Uh, Trey stopped 22 out of 23 shot. And by all accounts, I mean, again, from what I saw, which were mainly highlights and people talking about him online, super solid, was pressured early on, was able to stop the pressure. Chris Peters uh, had tweeted out that Augustine had to make some big saves down the stretch of the first period. USA outshot Norway 14 to 10. Um, but it was uh, he was able to get in there, stop pucks. He's, he just seems, every time I watch him or see clips of him, he's just so calm and poised but also large and takes up a ton of the net um but if you've watched any of him playing at michigan state and michigan state even retweeted uh the the tsn video saying that trey augustine with a standout effort for team usa he just looks right now polished i think that's a good yes. word for him he looks very polished and just he takes it as it comes to him and he has very little panic in his game what was neat about the broadcast today, again, really all the Wings prospects had a lot of great things said about him. And Augustine in particular, they mentioned how he's, quote unquote, only 6'1", but he plays a lot bigger. And what I liked about watching him today is he is very quick on his feet. Uh, there's a, one instance on a goal mount mouth scramble where the puck went past him on the right-hand side. If you're looking through, they've showed the camera feed through on the goal net and puck went by him he went he was up down to the butterfly pushed off to the side then back up to the middle but he kept everything tight and closed and he didn't look uh, kind of like you said out of place or scrambling if you will and that's something we've become very accustomed with with detroit goaltending as of late but he just he commanded the crease and commanded the net very well i thought in this opening game and for what we've been able to see so far to this point in the season that's kind of been par for the course so it was, it was a great opening match for him i thought yeah augustine was fantastic i thought um a lot of the reason why that game didn't really get away from team usa was was augustine because norway carried a lot of the play i would say for about a, a quarter to, to about a half of the, that game um somewhere between a quarter and a half of that game i thought that that norway was the better team they were beating USA to lose pucks. They were um, getting some a, great A opportunities, and Augustine obviously was was there to the challenge and making some really nice saves. Um, you know, um, Dave Starman mentioned on the broadcast that you know if, if Norway puts one in the net, you know their whole game plan changes. Like you know they start batting it down the hatches, much like you've seen uh, Finland do uh, in previous tournaments, where you know they go up one or two nothing and <laughs> All of a sudden, they're not playing any offense. They're sitting back, and it's going to be really difficult for you to try and score two goals to tie the game up. So I thought that Augustine was fantastic in keeping that a 0-0 game, and then once USA scored to make it one nothing, I thought the game was was not over, but, you know, right right about there, and then 2 nothing, it's, it's over at that point. Augustine has been fantastic uh, in the World Junior and at Michigan State, and I believe they're the seventh best team in the country right now, so... It'll be interesting to see. You're right. And Ryan, you said he's polished. He really does look like, you know, way more than just a freshman goaltender. I'll tell you that right now. Your point about Norway is what stood out to me. And you can really say the same about Finland. They both pressured the U.S. and Canada extremely well. And in that Norway game, their forecheck, I mean, it kind of reminded me of what Car Carolina does to you where it's just attack, 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 but they weren't really creating out. It's like they're missing their top scorers with Carolina where they're bugging the hell out of you, but they're not putting the puck in the net. But it also helped that Augustine was sound back there and keeping USA alive. But it also spoke to Team USA in that sense because their forwards are scary, man. Like Canada, out, they look good out there today, but the US, they were flying. And... You, it seemed like early on they were kind of struggling to put it together, and I think that spoke to Norway really putting that pressure on them and testing them in that first period. But once they settled down, it turned into a scary game. And it's hard to fault Augustine even for the one goal because you got a taste of what it's like to be Detroit Red Wings goalie by a shorthanded breakaway hit up coming at his way, which he actually almost got a piece of. It just beat him short, short side blocker. So overall, great performance, and that's – two of your top prospects arguably right now that you're hope, hoping for good things in the future. I got a couple just quick notes on, on the world juniors that I kind of want to touch on the fact that there's a full line 
from an NCAA team in Boston College. You have Perot, Will Smith, and Ryan Leonard. I mean, th- that's just incredible. I don't know that we've ever seen that before in the World Junior. We've seen a bunch of, uh, you know, team players on the same team. We've seen a bunch of Michigan players, a bunch of BU players, but I'm not sure that we've ever seen a full line like that. Wasn't this the third? I, they mentioned that in the broadcast too. Isn't this the third different team that these guys have all played together on? Yeah, it's crazy. The uh, and uh, the USND and oh my god, I can never do it. US National, National Development, Development Program. And yep, then there you go. B- BC and now the World Junior Team. So you're awesome. right. That's unbelievable. But I'll tell you one thing. The other thing that I, I just want to mention too, Jimmy Snugger, fantastic player. That guy's going to be a really good player in the NHL, I think. He's drafted by St. Louis. I'm really looking forward to seeing that guy in the NHL. There's a somewhere. lot of guys that we watched in a couple games today that you can say the same thing about. Cutter Gauthier, another guy. That guy's going to score some goals in this tournament. The one-timer, never afraid to shoot. Even when it doesn't look like he's a high-percentage scoring opportunity, he's got such a good shot that that everything he puts to the net looks like it has a chance to go in. So, um, And then I'll just give one other prop, and I know I'm a Michigan fan, so I guess I'll get some shit for this, but Seamus Casey is a fantastic fucking hockey player. I'm telling you right now, he's going to be a really good player in the NHL too. A good defenseman, never afraid to get in the rush. And uh, really, really, really good skater. Of all, of all the players from Michigan, I figured you were going to mention. I thought it was going to be Gavin Brindley. Yeah, Brindley was he good had too. A great game. Yeah, anyway. I agree with you 100. percent Brindley was fantastic. He was flying out there. Um, but Casey, every time the guys get the puck on a stick, this is not just in this tournament, but at Michigan too. He's always looking to make a play, and and honestly, maybe a little bit like selfish sometimes as a defenseman going into the rush, but he always makes something happen, even even at the NCAA level. So I'm interested to see what happens on, in this in this tournament going forward. Uh, and then just one other quick one, Lane Hudson's going to be a really good player in the NHL at some point as well. So, um, yeah, Montreal's got a really good one in Lane Hudson. 22.56 of ice time for Hudson. Yeah, that's nuts. I mean, we also had Axel's, uh, Axel Sandy and Pelica in there. Had an assist, uh, two penalty minutes, two shots with 17 minutes and 31 seconds of ice time. Was paired with Red Wings prospect Anton Johansson, who was a fourth round pick in 2022, had, who had three shots and was a plus one and had 20 minutes and three seconds of ice time. Johansson had several block shots as well. I thought defensively, he was awesome. He's been one to watch. He's been really good in the SHL as well. He's like one of the kind of maybe sleeper, like defensive defensemen that we kind of need. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of times where it seemed like Sweden was going to get pinched in their own own end. And he either got in a passing lane or blocked a shot or or forced a bad shot. And Pelika, I mean, you could tell the way that they were trying to use these guys. He, the, he was out there to wreak havoc in the offensive zone, and he absolutely did. And I think he was the first, was it the first or second goal he had a hand. I think it was the first goal that he fired on net, redirected off the teammate in front for the for beauty. But both guys, completely different players, and they both executed greatly. And Sweden was just dangerous as a whole out there. Yeah, the only other player we have uh, that has not played yet is Kevin Becker, plays for Team Germany. He was selected to play as well. They play tomorrow against Finland. That should be a decent matchup. matchup. I thought Sandy Pel- Pelica was really good, really dangerous out there for Sweden. Uh, I only saw about half of the game, but that first half of the game, I mean, he was dangerous. He had the shot from the point that was tipped in, um, so given his assist there. But I thought he was really good defensively, too. So just, I didn't, again, I didn't see everything that Sweden did, but, uh, you know, a pretty dominant, what was it, 5 nothing or 6 nothing? 6 nothing, two goals a period. And they just completely, I don't, I don't want to say owned it, but they owned the game. They, they were out shooting Latvia. Yeah, they, they, out, they outshot them early and often. They finished with 35 to 20 in shots. And they just, they looked like the Sweden you would expect. And you want to know a guy, speaking of guys that shoot the puck a lot, kind of what you're talking about with uh, Team USA, it seemed like every time he touched it, Lakaramaki was throwing the puck at the net. And it's, he, he only has five registered shots for the game, but I swear he had about 15 attempts. Yeah, those are just shots that hit the goalie. Yeah, 
that was nonstop. And because they kept talking about every time it hits the boards and the glass, the mics are crazy and it's super loud the way, like just how the boards are set up. But uh, I had to point that out because you're talking about shots. Yeah. I, I, and the one, one thing that I kind of noticed in watching, uh, you know, three of the four games today, I really didn't see a lot of the first game, Czech Republic and Slovakia or Czechia and Slovakia. Um, the boards are super loud and it's almost like the glass is old because I, I remember, you know, in some of the games that I played in some of like the old barns where you're taking a slap shot in, in warm ups and you miss the net, you hear like that bumping sound but it's like it doesn't sound anything like a glass does in like you know a north american rink or an NHL sounds like you're shooting a li- like against a literal barn yeah wooden barn yeah it's it's just very strange but the one other thing i just wanted to say too you were talking about how sweden is is really good yeah they're dominant when it comes to the preliminary round i think they had a streak of like 40 games in a row that they had won uh and i think that came to an end finally last year or the year before but yeah, they're they're pretty dominant in the preliminary round, and and usually they're one of the better uh, you know hockey nations as we all know. But it'll be interesting to see. Canada obviously had a ton of people there. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the video of all the Canadian fans uh, yeah. that made their way to. They were uh, on Gothenburg. course. It's unbelievable. But this tournament brings out the best in a lot. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to see where this tournament uh, goes. I I think I saw the other day or actually it was today that it's down to Las Vegas and Minnesota for 2026. I think it should be Minnesota because they haven't had one in a long time. Um, but I you, I guess you couldn't go wrong with Vegas. The only thing is with that, I don't know if you guys remember Toronto and Montreal in, in 17 and 19, I think it was. It's hard to do it in the NHL buildings and fill it up. You know, th- That's why even in Canada, the last couple of times that they've done it, it's been at smaller barns. I think they had Edmonton and Red Deer, but Red Deer was the the host, I believe. And then the, the bigger games were in Edmonton. But I don't know. That's just a side note. So tomorrow we've got four games. It is uh, Slovakia versus Switzerland, Finland versus Germany, Norway versus Czechia, and Latvia versus Canada. Those will be the four games tomorrow. The United States does not play again until the 28th versus Switzerland. It seems like they got like an easy schedule right at the beginning. They then play Czechia on the 29th. Uh, but it should be interesting to see that they think U.S. is favored. U.S. is the powerhouse in this tournament. So let's see Augustine stand on his head and uh, get some more wins. You know what I don't like? And and uh, Ryan, you probably remember this because, uh, Greg, I'm not sure how much of this tournament you've watched your entire life or whatever. Correct me if I'm wrong. But this tournament always seemed to be like Group A was USA, Canada, Russia, and and one other And it was always a powerhouse. And I know that they've kind of gone away from that. But, like, it's so weird not having USA and Canada in the same, you know, in the same group. I know it goes by, um, you know, the last year's uh, standings and all that stuff. It's just it always seemed like every other year you'd have Team USA and Team Canada on um, New Year's Eve as as in the preliminary round. And you don't get that now, which is kind of frustrating, actually, in my opinion. You want to play the best when it matters. So I, I don't like to take a lot of stock in the group matches because you can it is all gets thrown out when it comes to the bracket. So Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, what we're gonna do real quick is we're gonna take a quick commercial break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk Red Wings news, uh what happened the past three games, spoiler alert, we suck, and then uh kind of what's coming up uh with some more recalls. So we'll be right back after a quick message from our sponsor. Red Wings fans, you can bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. And now that Patrick Kane is in Detroit, those odds might just be getting better. Download the app now and use code THPN. New customers can get $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on hockey. That's code THPN only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. 
NHL, and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2003. All rights reserved. And we're back. And the Red Wings are not yet, but they are. They left to go on break on, like, not a great footing. We had left last episode saying that they needed five of six points, and they got two. Uh, they got two points. Uh, I mean, Patrick Kane has been the news. He's been fantastic. In a good way. He was named the NHL's third star of the week with eight points, uh, four goals, and four assists. And during the week, and it's just, I mean, he's been all over. He's been all over the ice. His passes are crisp. He's putting the puck in the net. He's tic-tac-toe with Alex Dabrinkit. He's playing amazingly the with Dylan Larkin. Up. His chemistry with Larks is fantastic. But the Red Wings defense, and I mean, goaltending is one thing with both our goalies going down, having to sign Hutchinson. Hutchinson got into the game against New Jersey and played well. He made very timely stops. It was not his fault that we lost at all. But what we had talked about, Ryan, before we started talking, before we hit record, the Red Wings cannot play with a lead. They get a lead and immediately it's gone within minutes. That was evident in that Flyers game where they went up five to one. That was the game they won six to seven in a shootout. It should have never gotten to that point. James Reimer's cooked. That's one thing like done. Can't can't do it anymore. But our defense just it's collapsing. It's the forwards not back checking fast enough. It's not covering your man. It's leaving dudes wide open in the slot. It's been absolutely insane the way that that they keep throwing the same defensive pairs out there most nights and expecting them just to do it. Just go out and do it. Like you you haven't done it for the past two weeks, but you know, you know, just go do it now. And it's not working. And I mean, it has to change now that uh, Christian Fisher and Jeff Petrie killed each other. And that Ole Mata is somewhere like not okay. He, he was hurt. Daniel Bruce tweeted out Derek Lalone confirms Ole Mata will be unavailable tomorrow. We'll have more in his status in the next couple of days. And I think that was the 22nd that that was tweeted out and there was no follow-up past that. So something is wrong with Ole Mata, but it just, it's been bad. It has not looked good and it's the same issues, the same issues we've seen time and time again that they have yet to fix. Yeah, I was looking at, at hockey reference in the month of December, one that we knew was going to be difficult. They uh they have a posted a record up to this point of four seven and one. They've got 40 goals for 49 against. Gone eight for 45 on the power play. Which let's do the quick math here. Eight divided by 45 at 17% rate. That's died off, which the last couple of games they had a they had a good stretch going there for a bit. But granted, the PK has been very good. Yeah. But when you look at so there's that was December. You look at the month prior to that in November, six, four, and two, 41 goals for 33 against, 10 for 57 on the power play. So roughly the same rate on the power play. But defensively, there's not good enough. 33 goals in the month of November. Compared to what we what I would just say, 49 in the month of December. Something's got to give, man. And we've I, I can't burst any more blood vessels trying to wrap my head around the fact that they can't they need to score four or more goals to actually win a freaking hockey game right now. And you have to go all the way back to beating Chicago on November 30th was the last time they won a game significantly like overwhelmingly good game of hockey they won five to one in that game and that was when they went on that great streak of beating new jersey boston and minnesota in three straight games so either there's scheme players i don't know what's going on at this point i, I it's it doesn't make sense like the the philly game they won it cool seven to six exciting Fun times. They were up five to one in the first period and barely came back to, and they had to come back to win it. I'm not saying that. I mean, that was what Carter Hart's first game back after being out with either sick or hurt or whatever it was. So it's not a surprise that they put the puck in the net with him, not being comfortable and just trying to get back in the swing of things after what he had. 
but to allow six goals again, and then thankfully you get a shootout victory, mainly because Patrick Kane saved your ass to win that game again in the shootout, uh, which I love the tweet or post that someone had found out there. Ken and Mick called Patrick Kane's very first shootout attempt with Chicago against Detroit. And then they got to call his first shootout attempt. That's amazing. For Kane in Detroit. So it's a weird situation, but regardless, still pretty cool. But back on team defense, I just, there's been, people have figured it out. You would think that the players and the coaches would be figuring this out as well. Because they're overcommitment, lack of communication. Everyone drops below the freaking uh, face-off dots. They're, 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 they don't defensively, more often than not, they don't look like an NHL team. And I don't know how to explain it. And it's not for a lack of trying as, as a whole in what they're doing offensively because they're still putting the puck in the net. I haven't seen what the latest is, but last time I saw it, it was maybe a week or two ago, they have the number, they're a top five scoring team defensively in terms of their defensemen putting points up on the board. So they're doing part of the good things. It's the rest of the thing that you te- technically pay to do that they're not doing. So help. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll tell you one thing right now. And this might just be the most simple thing that I can say about the woes that the Wings have had on defense. It's just way too easy. It's way too easy to score on the Wings. When the defense isn't playing well, the goaltending is giving up bullshit, you know, soft goals. When the defense is, when the goaltending is playing good, the defense is giving up lapses in front of the net. It's like you you can't have a, a game where a goaltender is making the saves he's supposed to, and the defense is keeping things up to the outside. And when it does get to the inside, the goalie's bailing you out once in a while, because that's another thing too. I know a lot of people want to give you know who so a lot of shit, and and rightfully so, I think rightfully so. But at the same time. You know, when you're hanging the guy out to dry, I mean, well, like, wh- what are you supposed to do? That game in, against Philadelphia was absolutely atrocious, I thought. And uh, yeah, you get off to a great start. I can just feel that, that that's how that game was going to go. Like, I thought they were going to lose because, you know, they get up 5 1 and then the game kind of gets tied up and Philly takes the lead and you have to tie it and then win it in a shootout. But you're lucky it went that way because if it didn't go that way, you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six games in a row lost going into Christmas break. Not a great spot to be in right now. And I guess the not so lucky part for the Red Wings is now they got at Minnesota, home against Nashville, home against Boston, and then at San Jose and at LA at Anaheim. So it doesn't get easier, I don't think. I mean, obviously Nashville isn't that good, but they've been playing better as of late. San Jose isn't that good. They're one of the worst teams in the league. But then you have Minnesota, who's played really good under the new coach there on John Hines. You have Boston, who's they've they've been a little up and down, but they're still the Bruins, right? They're still a pretty good team on on uh, New Year's Eve. And then you have at San Jose, at L.A., at Anaheim, and two of those teams, or I guess yeah, two of those teams are are teams that you should beat in San Jose and Anaheim. L.A. is a different story. We, we saw how that went the last time. Exactly. So the only way that this gets better is if you can defend. Because then then you have Edmonton, and then you have teams like Toronto and Florida and Tampa Bay. It doesn't get easier. The schedule isn't, isn't particularly easy uh, going into d- the end of December and the beginning of January, the middle of January. So they need to figure it out and figure it out fast. I don't know if it's trading for a goaltender. I don't know if it's... I don't know what the answer is because Alex Lyon, I mean, seemed to be the guy that you could kind of rely on to play well, and now he's down. Alex Lyon should be back. They said after Christmas he hasn't been activated yet, um, but it's possible that he does, and he could get in here pretty soon. But we were talking about needing to score. The Red Wings, and I did rough math here, I counted real quick, are 16-1-4 and four when scoring four-plus goals. They are 0, 14, and 0 when scoring less than four goals. If they are not scoring four goals, they are not winning the game. It's just not happening. Which steps back to our point of of being able to defend better and win close games. Yeah, it's playing complete. That's the problem. They're not playing a complete game. Not every function of the team 
like the forwards, the defensemen, and the goalie cannot all play one solid game. One piece falls apart. And when that one piece falls apart, one other piece also falls apart. So if our offense isn't going, then it's our defense is a letdown and we lose. If our offense isn't going, then our goalie is a letdown and we lose. If our defense isn't going, sometimes our offense breaks down and we lose. So if we can't overpower the team enough to where our our mid to bad defense can just just barely keep up and our goaltending just barely gets us through, then we're not winning. And that's the problem. We've got offense in bunches. That was clearly solved during the offseason. That offense problem, done. Amazing. Ryan, Ryan, you pulled up the stats earlier about our, our uh, goal differential. Like we were, we're what now? Plus seven goal differential when this yeah, we're definitely, last it's season. Strong we were from almost, it was a plus 18, 20 uh, as of like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Now it's dropped to a plus seven. But this same time last season, we were what? A minus seven. Yeah. So the scoring is not the issue. The issue is not letting pucks in. Like we're letting way too many in. But if you look at the league standings as of right now, the Red Wings are in fifth place in the division with 36 points, but we're only out of a tie for second place with Toronto and Florida by four points. They've got 40 points. This same time last year, the Red Wings had 35 points. We've got one more point right now. We have played two more games, but we have one more point than we did last year. Tampa right now has 39 points. At the same time last year, they had 41. Florida has... 40 points right now the same time last year they had 34 so they're the ones that are doing have kept up their momentum from last season this time last season toronto had 48 right now they have 40 and boston had 56 they have 44 so the eastern we thought it would be strong out the gate just crazy explosive it's cooled our division is cooled there's room for movement we are closer Mm. we just need to pick the playoff It needs to be consistent. And I know part of it was the Sweden trip. It knocked guys out. They're tired. They played so many games with so few minutes of rest that this holiday break should hopefully help them reset. And I just, I hope it gave Lion some time to heal up. I hope it let Stevie put some feelers out because Tyler, you're right. I think we need a goalie. I think that's an issue where we do not have one goaltender minus lion in a lot of games that can just go out and make a big save. The one thing we're asking you to do is make a big save. Hutch made some big saves during the Jersey game. He had some big saves, but he's not a guy that you're going to rely in, rely on night in and night out to make big saves like that. He was just playing for grand rapids on an AHL contract where he had to be released and signed to an NHL one in emergency conditions, basically. So we need a guy who you can say, oh, yeah, the defense fucked up, but thankfully we've got this goalie who can just make that save on a breakaway or make that save on an odd man rush where someone fell down. We don't have that right now. No, and it it speaks to the St. Louis game. I know it's it's back to to December 12th, but you have, it it wasn't Edmondson. It was one of their defensemen that got a break, shorthanded breakaway and scores on Huso. I'm sorry, that can't happen when a defensive defenseman has a breakaway and goes in and scores on your goaltender. You need to make a save at one point or another. I'm not saying you need to bail them out every single time that there's an opportunity um, that's a grade-A opportunity or anything like that. But a defensive defenseman, I wish I didn't remember who it was, but when a defensive defenseman gets a breakaway shorthanded, a guy that really has stone for hands, and he comes in and snipes your goalie, there's a major problem. Uh, that means you're either out of position or, you know, he just got shit lucky. But at the end of the day, you can't let that kind of stuff happen. And, you know, I'm not saying just that specifically, but that's just one thing that kind of stands out. And I'll tell you the other thing that stands out too. We talk about offense and yes, to bring it and, and Kane and Larkin are bringing their stuff to the table and they're, they're producing. I'd like to see some more depth production i feel like uh, you know rasmussen is one guy that kind of sticks out um you know obviously he's not playing the minutes that a guy like kane or demrinkit or raymond is playing but i'd like to see some production from the, the some of the depth pieces um 
you know, the third and the fourth line primarily, because, you know, if you're going to make the playoffs, you're going to need those guys to score hard, dirty goals. And for example, the game against Carolina, that was two to one, for example, the Philadelphia game that was one, nothing. Um, and for example, that New Jersey game that was three to two um, right before the holiday break, because Detroit played a really good game in, in that Jersey game. And they, they had a couple lapses and Jersey scored and they weren't able to get the momentum back. I, I think the biggest thing is is getting some some goaltending, but also some depth scoring, I think, is important, too. And I don't know if that means you have to take Kane and Debrink it away from each other. Does that mean that you do a first line of Kane, Larkin, and Raymond? Well, no, to see because what that the, looks last, like? the Jersey game was Debrink it, Larkin, and Kane, and they played phenomenally. I mean, your line, if you have a line of Debrink it, Larkin, Kane. I like that line. The only player on that line that's not a point per game currently is Debrink it. And he's two points under. He has 32 points in 34 games. Larkin is a point over a point per game. And Patrick Gain has 10 points in 10 games. So those guys are not the problem. And for people that want to say it's a Patrick Kane curse or whatever. No, it's not. He's literally right up there with Debrinket and with Larkin in level of play currently at 35 years old. The problem is right now, and people will laugh. The problem is guys like Justin Hole who are not showing up consistently every day. The problem is Jeff Petrie making literally the worst mistakes at the worst time. And people go, oh, he's one of the best defensive players on the team. But when you make the single mistake that ruins it for you, I don't care how good your defensive numbers look. When you're seriously, we're up by one and the one goal you let in screws us. Like that's, it just, it just does not help. So, and then a lot of people say, well, it's cider regression and it's Jake Wallman. They're only put out there against literally like the elitist of the elite talent. And it's, it's not fair on them to say they're ruining it. It's lower defense. It's goaltending. It's an amalgamation of things all going wrong at the same time. And literally our goalies making the dumbest mistakes at the worst times. That goes back to the point I made a little bit ago where just because our defensemen are putting the puck in the net or, or they're contributing on the score sheet isn't what you should be focusing solely on. Like, cool, Petrie and Sherrod have, what, 10 and 9 points respectively and can't really be too upset about that. Petrie said it had a great goal. He's had some good setups on, in the process. Same with Sherrod. But do you need to see these guys on the defensive side of things? And this is... Now, Ben, ben I can't really complain about recently. Sherrod's, for the most part, done his job this year. You can't. I, I, I totally agree with you. Petrie, there's been some games where those two have actually looked pretty competent together. But more often than not, you're like, what is going on? Why are you doing these things? And that's, I'm speaking on that one to your Petrie point. And honestly, you've, every single one of our defensemen, you can argue, you've, you've said these types of things about. And it's frustrating because one thing that I see Time and time again, outside of the communication piece, which is just a hot freaking disaster, is they just really, and we saw this in the World Juniors, today, and they really made a lot of comments about it. They just fling the puck around the boards, hoping one of their the wingers or someone on the team is there. They don't really look where they're trying to throw the puck out to. Cider is one of the worst ones with it as of late as well. Trying to either clear the puck up the middle or flinging it around the boards, and it basically turns into a reset for the offensive team that they're going against. Now they've got their off. Ever, now we're trying to scramble back into position. This is where you start to see the breakdown in communication where two forwards now collapse on a defenseman, leaving a wing wide open in the slot, which then pulls one of your defensemen out. Then they shift over. And hey, guess what? Now you've got a guy wide open on the back door to score a goal against you again. But it doesn't. But it, the problem is, is this is happening over and over and over and nothing's yeah. getting fixed. Yeah, it's giving up the puck and then immediately entering panic mode when you didn't have to give up the puck in the first place if you would just pass to a person instead of passing it around the boards. And it's almost like they know the plan is to pass around the boards, but then they don't know that the plan is also to go retrieve the puck that's being passed around the boards. And and like we talked about it last week, it's dumping it to no one. It's dumping it in when there was a pass to be made without getting a shot on net. It's getting a shot on net, but then immediately giving up on the rebound. It's stuff like that that not that doesn't just like lead to offensive issues, 
it more so leads to defensive issues because then your defensemen are pinched in and it leads to an odd man rush down the ice. It leads to a, you're on a change, you're on a bad line change now because you gave up on a battle. They win the battle, you're doing a change, they're sending guys up ice. It's not working out. So again, that's partly coaching. I, I love what Bob Bugner has done, not recently. Not recently on the defensive side of things. So I'm wondering if maybe they need to shake up their game plan if they need. And I, they watch tape. We know they watch tape. How do they not so. see this and say this? They is had the stuff need. on the bench to watch it even. Yeah. So the one thing that they did that might help them, and it did kind of help them against Jersey, is because Olimato went down, Simon Edvinson was recalled. Simon Edvinson did not have a flashy game against Jersey. He had a solid game against Jersey. And that's kind of what you want as like one of your first games back, not mentioning him, which means he's not doing anything terrible. When you don't say a defenseman's name during a game, normally that's a good thing. Uh, he was sent back. Uh, he is back now. He was sent back for the holidays. He is back now with Jonathan Berggren and Austin Zarnick. If you watched the Jersey game, Christian Fisher and uh, Jeff Petrie ran head. They went Fisher went for a hit. Petrie was coming across the ice. And Petrie and Fisher's heads collided. And one or both probably have concussions. Uh, Christian Fisher was put on IR. And uh, Berggren will come in and take his place, which is good because Berggren provides you more offense, but he takes away from your defense. So you're hoping that Simon Edvinson, who had, uh, I had this pulled up, Simon Edvinson had like 13 minutes of ice time. Uh, he had 13 minutes and 18 seconds of ice time against Jersey with 19 shifts. So I expect that to go up. He was playing on the bottom pair. I With Petrie out, put him with Ben Schrott. That's fine. Give me a second pair of... Uh, Schrott's played right side before. Give me a second pair of Edvinson Schrott. I feel like that could actually work out pretty well. Yeah. I mean, Edvinson is supposed to be a more offensive Mo Sider. And Mo Sider has been... I feel like Mo Sider the past few games is on his like revenge tour. He's been towards the top of the stat sheets. Um, if you look at hockey scorecard, he's been at the top and he's played a more aggressive game. He's played a better defensive game. Now that's also due in part with they've removed Jake Wallman from his pairing. So I don't know if it's just Mo feels like he needs to make up for other people constantly where he ends up digging himself a hole. But I think if he just played the game, even if Wallman was there and he just played the game he played the past couple games, I think it'd be better off for him. They finally broke him up, and it was a little bit bittersweet, but much overdue. And if it continues to work this way, I'm all for it, because the stat that we saw put out there today, who was it? From Jennifer Morris here. She pulled Puck IQ's Wood Money feature. The defenseman with at least 300 minutes of time on ice this season, and Wallman Insider playing against, what, 40, 30? Five and 37% of the time they're on the ice. Like you kind of said earlier, they're playing against top pair or top forward lines in the league. Yeah. And I'll throw this graphic up on the screen. What the uh, wood money tier does is it shows the level of competition of forwards faced by the player as either elite at the top, uh, middle in the middle and what they consider uh, grit intensity, which are like your low level, like bottom pair defensemen on the bottom. So if you're Mo Sider and Jake Wallman, you're at the top where most of the time you're playing against high level without playing those low level players. Which is great. I mean, it, it speaks to the trust and what they see in these two. And I think it's as fans that we would agree that's what they're, they're there for. They're a top pairing defenseman. The top pairing defensemen. And we want to see them against the best. However, I think with the way that these games have gone, they're wore out. I mean, you can speak to the, Sw the Sweden trip all, all day, but at the same time, they're, they're out there averaging. What's their average time on ice right now between those two? Uh, let's see. Moe's averaging 2209, and Wallman's has actually dipped a bit. He's at 1950, but they're still the top two outside the goaltenders in average time on ice on this team. I think Ghost, he's been getting a little bit, a lot more responsibility. And we've actually seen him with Cider as of late, and they've they've hit it off awesome. But you got to just think at this point, and we and it still seems like that as we've talked about a little bit, Wallman might still be ailing out there from the injury that he had. And he just 
something he took a has shot to the off. knee recently too, didn't he? Oh, he took. Yeah, he I think did. it was Trevor Thompson reported on that one. He took. He blocked a shot. It was a great block. And I guess the next day, the bruise was like softball size or bigger on the inside of his one knee. The way he took that puck, I mean, he actually what is he top five in block shots this year, Wallman? And he still played in that, and he still played in the next year. That was a St. Louis game. He still played two nights later against Carolina, and that just goes to show you what NHL players character. do to continue to play. Uh, show. Warriors, Tyler. So this is at NBA <laughs> players. You need a fucking in-season tournament to to play. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, you got you got to keep them excited somehow because we, we got the Pistons are down down by ninety-seven two. to ninety-nine currently with six minutes and thirty-three seconds left. About to break the record, baby. Break the record for most consecutive losses. It's incredible. But anyways. And I believe that is out of all major sports. What? What is it with the trade How many teams and breaking and losing row records? That? Huh? I believe this will be 28, 28 Seven. losses in a row. <laughs> this will be 27. 27? 27th consecutive in season, like same season loss. I think there's a record for like 28 games that spans two seasons. Yeah, it goes over two seasons. This would the be single the single season record Detroit is tied with at 26 games. Yeah, and this I believe like the like I said I believe it is also the longest single season losing streak for any pro sport. They haven't won in 2 months almost. No. So back on Wallman real quick though. He is tied for 5th in the league in block shots. And Mort Sider is 15. So Jake Wallman's blocked 85 shots. Jake Truba is at first at 103. Wallman's at 5th and 85. And Mort Sider is 15th with 78. The next closest Red Wing is Ben Sherrod at 67. Is 31st. Yeah. So, so your top shots. two guys are seeing a lot of minutes. They're seeing the best players in the league. And they're also getting hit with the puck a lot. Well, the Red Wings do play the Minnesota Wild tomorrow at 5 p.m. The episode should be out. You could be listening to it before then. At what Uh, time? 5 p.m. That's Sunday. Uh, My screen right here. 8 p.m. tomorrow night. Tomorrow night's 8 o'clock. Google has it at 5. Well, now when you click it, it says 8. The main Google (laughs) screen, if you're Googling Red Wings schedule, it says 5 p.m. right on there. But if you click it, it says 8 p.m. So 8 p.m. 29th on Friday, they play the Preds. That's a home game. They play at 7. And then on Sunday, New Year's Whoa. Eve, which I will be at, they play at 5. All this stuff is screwed up. So mine says, uh, Google says tomorrow they play at 5. It says they play the Preds on Friday at 4. And it says they play the Bruins on Sunday at 2. Is your it's in Pacific my, location I am not set, up? No, I'm uh, no, I'm set to my normal time zone. It says it's nine fourteen p.m. right now. Huh, I'm no fine with that. Wait, is that on your phone or what is that? No, on? right in my browser on Chrome. Pistons are down six now. By the way, that happened quick. Great, beautiful. But the Red Wings do play the Wild tomorrow. So what I want before we sign off is uh, give me your I guess keys to the game. How how do the Red Wings win tomorrow against the Minnesota Wild? And then give me your socials. We'll start with Ryan. Uh, play sound sound defensively. I I think this is a team they can beat again. And if... Rhymer's in net, by the way. Okay. Play sound defensively. Because a lot of the BS has been with Rhymer in net. He's done... At times, he has made saves that you would hope that he would a uh, goal he needs to make. And if they can just couple that with playing as a team... They can win this game. That's all I care about at this point. I want to see a, a, a win that's less than four goals on the board. Give it to me. And mi- at Minnesota is a game where you might have to do that. So we'll see what happens. Already Ryan, 33. Yeah, I mean, the keys to that game, I mean, I, I kind of echo what you said, Ryan, but I will, I'll just take it one step further. You got to shut down that first line, Kaprizov, Erickson, Eck, and Boldy. That's their three best players on offense. Out of the box. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and uh, you're 100% right. That's how you do that, uh, especially with Kaprizov on the power plays. He's lethal, as is Matt Boldy. Erickson Eck, obviously, just in the middle of those two, but but those are potentially the three best players on the team. Marco Rossi might have something to say about that um, on offense anyways. Uh, and then really getting some shots on, um, on whether it be, uh, what is it, Gustafson, or uh or flurry whoever ends up playing 
Uh, so th- those are my keys to the game. I, I think you really just need to get some shots on that and and really kind of pepper Flurry or Gustafson, whoever it is that, that ends up starting. Uh, and then when you get power play opportunities, try to cash in on them. I mean, the, the power play hasn't been great recently, but they got to get it going. And hopefully, you know, just getting away from the craft for a couple of days has has helped clear their mind and, um, you know, got them trending in the right direction. But you can follow me on Twitter at SealDog91. Yeah, mine's going to be kind of the same. It's going to be capitalize on the power play, because like you said, it's not been great. Uh, penalty kill was good. I mean, it was good uh, against the Devils, who are one of the top power play teams in the league. They were able to shut them down really effectively. So if we can keep that going, but improve our power play, keep the forward core going, but improve our defense. And then my key for James Reimer is just please play well. Don't make a stupid mistake. I think that's something our goalies have been really good for at least once a week is just making a mistake that ruins the entire game. So just don't make a mistake, uh, but just keep rolling the way you're rolling. And I think you'll get more wins than you don't as long as your defense improves. And hopefully Simon Edmondson helps pick that up and and make Steve Eiserman make a really difficult decision in keeping him on the team. Um, But you can follow me online at Bringing the Wing. You can follow the Grindline Podcast online at Grindline Pod. We like to thank the Hockey Podcast Network for hosting us and spreading us around. Uh, We do have a YouTube channel. Go over to YouTube. Check us out at Grindline Pod. Sub to our channel. Turn on notifications. You'll get notified whenever we go live. We have to thank uh, Vintage Detroit for uh, everything they do. They do amazing work. It's the only place you should get your Detroit jerseys from and work on. Ryan has a point. Now, as I say, Vintage uh, owes a Minnesota Vikings fan a jersey, it would look like, after uh, Detroit. On the north, yeah. Let's go Congratulations Lions, to the Lions Woo! for uh, thirty years of poor ownership and management until oh. this point. Uh, but Fun. yeah, go check out Vintage. They're the only place you should get your jerseys from. They're absolutely amazing. Buy up those Adidas jerseys before they switch over to Fanatics for the NHL because Fanatics has done themselves zero favors lately. If you go search like Fanatics fail or Fanatics on Twitter you will see all of the Christmas presents that were ruined because Fanatics is absolutely awful. Uh, but you can also check out our merch on redbubble.com by searching the grind line. We got a bunch of fun designs up there that I was just made aware that I need to go report a bunch of people for stealing my designs because they do it quite frequently. So uh, go check it out. Buy merch helps keep the lights on. That's going to do it for tonight. So for Ryan and Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy. Hockey down.